Hello Mario, it's super good to, uh, to see you. We are here at the IMI. Uh, maybe you'll tell us a few words about uh, what is the IMI. Maybe uh, the first question is, who are you? What is your story? Who are you, Mario? Ah, it's a big question. Who am I? I've been trying to figure that out for 60 years. No. Um, well, uh, I've been living in France for the last 30 years. And uh, originally, uh, my original training, uh, since before I started my doctorate and during my doctorate and after, was in experimental psychology, so research with uh, people. And my specialization was research on exceptional experiences. Uh, so how can we uh, investigate in a laboratory context, how can we investigate questions such as premonitions or um, what we call psychic healing, for lack of a better word, or what we sometimes call telepathy. These, these events which seem to occur quite often, actually, in people's lives, at least that's what surveys say, uh, can we investigate them in a more controlled, scientific way in a laboratory context. So that's my, that was my first passion, let's say, and training and career. When I came to France, I had to, I continued somewhat in that, but I wasn't working anymore in a normal, you know, full-time job, because in the States I was working in laboratories in New York and in Princeton. On um, this subject. On this subject, and uh, full-time and with good financing and so forth. When I came to France, the situation was totally different, of course. There was absolutely no room for discussing even these kinds of phenomena seriously. Uh, and so, for a while, I stopped with that, and I reoriented my career, so to speak, to uh, another topic that interested me, which is creativity. And human I'd creativity. like to tell you more about uh, creativity, but first, uh, that's very interesting. So 30 years ago, all this subject that you call exceptional human, experience. human experiences were, if not main mainstream, at least they were subject in the US and they were not subject at all in France. That's what you are saying? Yes. Basically, in the United States, there was real research going on and in several laboratories. Uh, there were two in Princeton, just to give you an idea, two big laboratories in Princeton. Uh, one was ours and the other was in the Princeton Engineering uh, Department of the University. And then there were others in, in Texas and in California and in the north of the states. Uh, and at that time, much less happening in Europe. A little bit in, in Holland, in Germany, uh, but certainly not in France. It was pretty dead. And how is it today? How is it today in the US and how is it today in the rest well, of the world? Things have changed actually. In the US, there's uh, now basically one major institute. It's in California. It's called Noetics Institute or Institute of Noetic Sciences. And it was created by uh, an, an astronaut named Edgar Mitchell, quite known astronaut, who was interested in consciousness research. Uh, and that's the main uh, important laboratory today in the States, in California. And in Europe, actually, things have changed. There's quite a bit of research in England and Great Britain uh, in university contexts. There are several universities that are now, uh, and since a couple of decades, that are doing parapsychology research. Uh, in Germany, there's a very big uh, center. Uh, and in Holland, there still are some. In Italy, there's a re-emergence of parapsychology. And in France, there's the Institut Metapsychique, which is the IMI, uh, which has been a long-standing uh, uh, institute of research here. But when I had arrived, it was kind of in a low, low, very low phase. So we'll come back on that. Now let's uh, go back 30 years. So you arrive in France, no room for uh, all this subject at that time. Yeah. So you change uh, your path, like you said, and you work on creativity. Yes. I, I still was doing some development in the field of parapsychology. I was doing some uh, uh, software development for testing people. 
and I also created a CD-ROM. Uh, but basically, I had to change directions. So I, um, I explored uh, organizational creativity, and I went and did, in, back in the States again, in uh, uh, near Chicago, in Buffalo, New York, there is a big center of professional creativity, organizational creativity, um, which dates from the brainstorming era from the 50s. And so everybody that is anybody in creativity has to go through this uh, major center. And so I did as well, and then I came back and I started uh, first as a professor at CRC, HSC CRC is the uh, at Julien Josas, uh, doing uh, seminars inter entreprise for for managers and directors from different companies, and progressively more and more I started uh, doing things for interventions within organizations mm -hmm. intra entreprise uh, with specific issues that they wanted to explore using creative process. And I did training, and now I'm doing consulting and coaching as well. So that's basically my professional activities are on uh, the use of creativity to forward uh, companies' innovation potential. And can I say that today it's still your main activity? That's right. Okay. So I would say that all the other activity, like the IMI, is more like your passion. Yes, you might say so, but. It's, it's, a Both passion. it's a passion that consumes a lot of time because uh, there's first, as I'm the president of the IMI, that's, there's all the administrative aspects, mm -hmm. but on top of it, we're getting uh, funding for different research projects, and so I'm quite involved in the research again. So tell me more about the IMI. We are here. What do you do? Uh, what's the purpose? What's the subject? What do you do? M maybe first I should say that when we met, I can't remember if it's 10 or 15 years ago, uh, but the, the, I heard you listening at the Club of Budapest, I think, and I remember that what was really touching, if not shocking to me, uh, I've been reading for many years, I guess it's part of our age, uh, to read about this parapsychology event, and, and I'm an engineer, kind of, kind of basic, so I was uh, both uh, very attracted and very skeptical. Mm -hmm. And when I heard you, I heard you, and, and you were like saying on this subject, we need to be more rigorous, mm -hmm. more, more scientists than the scientists, yeah. or who claim they are scientists. Yeah. And, and that was very impressive uh, to me. And this is really how I get into what uh, you are going, doing now. So tell me, what do you do at IMI? Well, that's actually the, so the IMI, Institut Métapsychique International, uh, it has a long tradition. It's almost a century old. In two years, it will be a century old. And it started with a, a number of scholars and scientists, some of whom were Nobel Prizes already, and, uh, like Charles Richer, and some very known, like Camille Flammarion and uh, others, that uh, were interested in the phenomena that were kind of being reported at the time. This was the time of mediumistic phenomena mm. and spirit circles and so forth. And there were very strange things happening there. And everybody knew that some of those things were probably fraudulent or erroneous, but there were some who also who looked very closely at these issues and couldn't dismiss them so easily. Some of them were real at least in their observation. So at this time, the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century, a number of uh, societies, academic, you know, scholarly societies were born. The first in England, the Society for Psycho Research, and then soon afterwards the Institut Métapsychique mm. in France, and also in the States. Uh, all these kind of, in the same 10, 20 years, there was this emergence of uh, institutes involving very high-level scientists who want to take a serious, hard look at these phenomena. And um, so, from the beginning, the, 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 the idea was we want to research the phenomena without the spiritualistic or spirit mm. associations. We want to be 
focused on just the facts and not the beliefs. Oh, this was the kind of orientation, and from the beginning, from the beginning, from the beginning, from the beginning was very. Uh, so, in a way, even though it was the, um, the one of the people who invested money in the institute and helped it be born was himself a spirit. He was interested in spiritism, but from the beginning, he he knew that the condition was that the research would be objective and would not be just in the service of spiritism. It could rege end up rejecting spiritism. So that was fair play. And um, so the Institute had a number of very good researchers and presidents and directors uh, so who got to study the phenomena with what we call special subjects. People that seem to be quite, first of all, uh, quite capable of producing the phenomena under controlled conditions, phenomena like, uh, let's say, telepathy, or we call it telepathy, we don't really know what that means, but we know that there are phenomena that are associated with it. And uh, so there were uh, directors who were focused on these kinds of phenomena and were trying to analyze and observe them close up. Close up. Uh, and then, like I said, there was a period where basically the post-war period was very difficult mm. for the Institute because all the financing was finished and it was just kind of barely surviving for a few decades. And, um, and then, uh, at some point, uh, I was asked to become president of the Institute uh, by... Uh, I, I was kind of known for my... Uh, background in the field, and uh, this was in 19, late 1997 that I was asked to become president, and uh, I accepted, and so this is, here I am 20 years later. Uh, so the focus right now, my, my personal orientation was to reestablish the, the, let's say, experimental orientation of the Institute, meaning the, the importance of doing research mm. and not just talking about the phenomena or just having some conferences or things like that, but doing some real research. So today there's a few research projects that are going on. And on what Carol. kind of phenomena are you actually working? You mentioned telepathy. What are the phenomena? Okay, so one of course is telepathy, which is also known as mind-to-mind -mind communication. Uh, what's interesting right now, the an experiment that's ongoing, is on precognition. It's whether or not people can anticipate future events that, in principle, cannot be anticipated. Is that the one that I've been a guinea pig that's for? Correct. Okay, so yes. I know. Otherwise it. known as a participant. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, participants. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, we have 80, 80 individuals who participated in this uh, experiment, and today is the closing day of this experiment. Um, so this is an experiment that tries to combine uh, immersive technologies and audiovisual graphics and so forth, and um, in order to put people in a relaxed, open, to prepare people for the, the uh, PSI, the ESP task, the precognition task, and it combines those kinds of technologies with, um, I would say, classical precognition task, which is, can you anticipate a random event more often than you would expect by chance? Mm -hmm. And can that be sustained? Can it be amplified? Are there certain personalities or mental states that are more conducive to this occurring than other ones and so forth. So we're, this is kind of like very, uh, let's say, microscopic work mm. on trying to first establish is there a phenomenon, but that, that's kind of, I think that's established now that there is a phenomenon, there is a, a very big body of research in this area right now. But more than that, to try and understand the dynamics of the phenomenon what enhances it, what suppresses it, and so forth. So telepathy, precognition, 
Any other things? Micro-psychokinesis, which is psychokinesis, telekinesis, uh, which is the influence of the mind or mental processes, the influence on physical processes. Now, we know from television or from the media or something, we know about macro-psychokinesis, and that's, you know, like people like Geller, bending spoons and so forth, which, you know, those are a little bit more controversial uh, as to whether or not, again, there's sometimes there's fraud, sometimes maybe there's real phenomena, and it's a very tricky area to investigate. But there's another form of psychokinesis which is much more subtle, uh, much tinier, and we call it micro-psychokinesis. And that is the question as to whether individuals can slightly change the behavior of random systems. Can they slightly change when you have a, an electronic mm. random system, coin flipper, can you make it go through your intention, through your need, through your desire, through concentration, through meditation? Is there a way to slightly bias it in one direction or the other? and uh, do this enough so that it's statistically significant. So that's also an area... Fascinating. So at that stage, I can't resist to ask you the question. After all these years yes. uh, working on this subject, having here and elsewhere an incredible amount of data and research, are these phenomena real? <laughs> I mean, according to you, what do you according think? After, after all these years, yeah. what do you think? Well, I, I have no doubt that some of these phenomena are real. Notably, I think that precognition and or microcyclinesis are real. That's for sure. Um, it gets a bit complicated afterwards because telepathy... I have no doubt that the experiments that study telepathy have produced results that are significant and real. But some theoreticians think that telepathy, which is a kind of a cross space mm. anomaly, can be explained by precognition, which is an across time anomaly. Mm. So, experimentally, telepathy, I'm absolutely convinced, exists. But whether it's a fundamental phenomenon or not, whether it's a phenomenon that's, that cannot be reduced to another phenomenon, that I'm not sure about today. Clear. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying that all these phenomena are real. I may say all. I, I said specifically, for example, two. one of the phenomena yeah. that interests historically uh, parapsychology, psychical research, is the question of post-mortem survival. Is there anything that remains after the physical body dies? And that clearly is an unresolved question. I mean, we can't say no, because there is a lot of different areas uh, which produce very striking anecdotes, um, like, for example, the case studies of children that have memories of past life, past lives, which were studied by uh, an American psychiatrist named Ian Stevenson, but others as well, there are a, a very considerable collection of children with these memories uh, in India first, but then also in Europe, in Turkey, in the United States, in places that are unexpected. In fact, the database is very big. Now, so there is something happening there, but can we explain this in a different way than the idea of a soul or a spirit that survives death? That's an open question. And there are many in the field that think we should prefer to explain it with other phenomena than to accept uh, post-mortem survival. And there is others who, it's a controversy, it's, a, it's an open debate. So not all is accepted in the field as proven, but some things are experimentally at least very, very well established. 
Very interesting. I'm not sure so many people are aware of that. No. And can you give us one example of one thing you would consider proven and how it has been proven? Okay, let's take precognition. Uh, now there are over the last 50 or 60 years there have been different protocols that explore precognition, different ways to explore it. One of the more recent ways has been using physiological measures. So you have a subject, a gobai, <laughs> in front of a TV, of a monitor, a computer mm -hmm. screen, and the computer has two kinds of images, a data bank with two kinds of images, either very normal, calm, neutral images, a nice landscape, uh, a child laughing, whatever, or very aggressive, very violent, very uh, shocking images. And then you have a random generator that for each trial decides will I show the shocking image or will I show the neutral image. So it's totally random. Now, the person is hooked up to physiological systems, like for example, what we call skin conductivity, which is a measure of uh, sweat, humidity on your hand, which is correlated to stress. It's a very good use, mm. for example, in lie detectors. So they're hooked up with this, and they're sitting there in front of the computer, and the, they we're looking at their physiology, and we know what their physiology is being recorded. So every once in a while, an image comes up every few seconds. Now, the image could be either one or the other, randomly. So, after the image comes up, we can see, of course, afterwards, that if it's a neutral image, their physiology stays relatively flat. If it's a shocking image, there's this ju big jump of an increase, for example, in sweat levels, because they're, they're reacting like this. So that's totally normal. But the part that is interesting to us is what happens before they see the image. Indeed, before the image was even selected randomly, what is happening to their physiology? Because we're looking at it constantly. And what we find is that the physiology begins to become disturbed before the selection of the image is being done in the computer. And it's not disturbed when the image, the future image, is going to be mm. neutral. There wait, wait, wait. Here, I guess we are talking about statistics. Yes, of course. The, the, um, and what is the level? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how many people are showing this mm. thing. Okay. Uh, and and an average people, how much, how many times will he or she show? this precognition. Yes. Okay. How, how okay. do you look at statistics? Course, it's, it's a statistical approach, which means that what you have is you have this time period during which the experiment takes place, and that time period is broken up into many equal mm -hmm. time segments. And let's say you have 100 subjects, and each one does 20 of these trials. So what you do statistically is you take the hundred subjects each with each segment and you superimpose the, the specific let's say the, the the 15th segment here and the 14th segment if you have a hundred of those segments you know because you have a hundred subjects in the 14th slot so you can see exactly what's happening there and when we compare the the difference between high stimulation or low stimulation, it's across subjects. It's all okay, subjects. It's together. not for one subject. It's yes. not, we're not looking at one subject because what we call the statistical power is not sufficient okay, to yeah. see with just one subject what's happening. It could be look big, but it may be just statistical you know, variations. So the way we understand these phenomena is in terms of, it's like a a very weak signal in, in radio technology, whatever, that we try to amplify by re repetition. So it's as if we have this extremely weak 
precognition signal that somehow is in there, but in order to, to find it, we have to do again and again and again the experiment, and then we start seeing that indeed there's something happening before the target, which is analogous to what's happening afterwards. But this is averaged over many people. Now there are some populations, some subject populations, that seem to do better than other ones. And an example of that is meditators seem to generally do better in these tasks. And how better? Are we talking like about one person, no, ten person? No, no, we're talking when we talk about these experiments. There, there, there may involve fifty. One experiment, fifty, eighty, one hundred individuals, and so it's normal people. There's no. We're not looking for a psychic. We're looking for just normal people and saying, perhaps even in the normal population, there's a very modest but real level of precognition going on unconsciously. It's like what we call intuition, like gut feelings and all that. Maybe a gut feeling is a real feeling of a future event. Sometimes, not always, but maybe some of those gut feelings are pointing to precognition. At any rate, what we find in the laboratory is that very subtle feelings like just heart rate or, or skin conductivity somehow are predicting unpredictable future events. Mm. Unpredictable because they're random. Absolutely fascinating. Mm. Today, uh, how would you describe the, the state of this field, of all this research? research? How, how is it going on today in, in the world? Well, it's... There's, a, I believe, a, a slow but steady incline, you know, moving up in terms of not just the scientific case in favor of, because I really believe that the reality of some of these phenomena has been established some time back in experimental context. But then there's the social reality mm. of the phenomena. There's the thing of whether other fields, other scientists, accept the reality. And that's been kind of a battle for decades and decades because it's true that these phenomena can be very disturbing to our models our paradigms of what's real and what's you know subjective and all that. So they're very provocative phenomena conceptually, conceptually, um, and that means that I think there's going to be a lot of resistance to that. On the side of the skeptics, they'll say it's not resistance; it's just we're just being conservative, and uh, you haven't proved your case. I think that that's dishonest. But that's my opinion, and that's the opinion of those, of those who are within the field. I think the case has been made. But what's happening, um, I don't remember if it was Oliver Lodge, there was this great scientist uh, in the early 20th century who said, we are just going to keep bombarding them with data, with the facts, <laughs> with science, until the only resort they have after they've tried to find all the holes, is that you're lying. When we get to the point where the only resort that other scientists have to denying this is by saying you're lying, you're fraudulent, or this and that, then morally we have won. And right now, I think the case is getting so strong that for scientists to deny that there's something happening, something, just an anomaly, uh, they have to say that you're all lying. You know, so we got to that point. That's where today. they are. And now, the, but it's also more than that because more and more we're using very sophisticated analytical procedures, methodological procedures, in some ways because of all the criticism that's been uh, used to, to stop this field. Psy researchers are better equipped mm -hmm. than psychologists, medical researchers, and others in terms of all kinds of controls, 
uh, all kinds of analytical and reporting protections and so forth. So I think right now the both the data case, you know, the facts, scientific facts, the, the research, and the the solidity of communication is going up. And I think that the, the debates now are getting more and more sophisticated with the skeptics. Because there are many skeptics in the field. We're all skeptics. We're skeptical about each other. But it's the kind of skeptical skepticism that you have in healthy science. The unhealthy skepticism is one that says first, no, it's impossible, and then tries to find reasons it's impossible. Mm. <coughs> so what about the future? How do you see the future of this field? I think that one of the breakthroughs will be when in physics we find a plausible explanation for at least one of the phenomena. And right now, precognition might be a candidate for that because there's a lot of discussion in physics that has nothing to do with parapsychology about whether or not the concept of time as a one-way dimension is fundamental or just statistical. There's, there's discussions as to whether in some sense time is symmetrical just like every other variable in physics is symmetrical that perhaps time also flows upwards and so when you have precognition perhaps it's this complex system we call the brain that catches a few signals coming from the future call it advanced waves, we call there different names. Nothing right now is established, but there is a lot of interest in the physics community on the question of temporal symmetry or something like retrocausality. And if that continues, and if some plausible theoretical constructs come through, then it will give a, a basis for understanding Precognition, in particular, and maybe even micro PK or micro psychokinesis. So that's one uh, avenue that I think is quite significant right now. Um, and the other, of course, is just getting better and better in determining what makes um, data, positive data, happen. If, for example, we find a profile of individuals who seem to be more produce mm -hmm. positive effects uh, versus the profile of individuals who seem to produce systematically negative effects, the more closely we define that profile, the more we'll be able to get reliable data. And I think that, I'm not saying that we're going to ever get to a technology. I don't think it, maybe it will become, but. I'm not betting on saying that we're going to create a switch for, pre for, for anticipating the future. Some think that that's possible in 50, 100 years. We'll have a switch, a mental wow. switch, to predict a future event. But even if it doesn't go that far, there might be some intrinsic constraints to doing that. Even if it doesn't go this, that far, I think we'll get to the point where we can have a high uh, accuracy level for predicting uh, results. And, and listening to you, I feel like your field is almost at the crossing of the most advanced whatever happens now. Like you, you mentioned neuroscience, you mentioned physics, uh, you slightly mentioned not spirituality but meditating people, yeah. which is some more sure. for many of them linked, not all of them, but for some of them linked to spirituality. So, we have never talked so much about uh, advanced physics. I think we have never talked so much about neurosciences. Mm -hmm. We have never talked so much, at least in the West, so-called West, about spirituality and, and, and meditation. How, how do you see all these fields maybe crossing each other or helping each, each other? There, do you see anything happening because of, of that? Well, of course, there is... Uh a big issue in science, which is silos, the silos of each field, and those silos are getting deeper and deeper because 
the, the technicity mm -hmm. of knowledge is getting more and more complicated so that now you can have chemists that cannot talk to each other because they're, they're just in, uh, looking at one little <laughs> aspect of or biochemistry or whatever. Biology is amazing. So there's that problem that there's a lot of difficulty in transversal science. You know, science that, that crosses across discipline and has disciplines talk to each other. Um, but there is this whole area of consciousness research now, which has developed in the last 20 years, and which I consider parapsychology being really part of consciousness research, which is trying to create links mm -hmm. between different uh, domains, especially between neuroscience and advanced physics, I mean fundamental physics. Mm -hmm. And parapsychology is definitely in that realm, because from the beginning, I, don't, I actually don't like the term parapsychology, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a poor term. It should have been called psychophysics. And there are many of us, when I was working in Princeton, our laboratory was named Psychophysic Research Laboratory. Because in a way, what we're, we're studying is the crossing mm -hmm. of mental and physical variables. We're talking about the interaction. Where are the limits of the mental and the physical, and how do they interact? So, I think that even though we continue to further go down the rabbit hole with the, uh, with the, the silos of each science, that there has to be also more thinking similar to what's happening in parapsychology and metapsychi uh, that's crossing over. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. It's very difficult because uh, we don't want to do it superficially. We don't want to say just because uh, there are some weird things happening in quantum physics and there's some weird things happening in parapsychology, just say, oh, they're, they're the same thing. And many, people, many people do and that. And many people do this, you hear, with quantum medicine yes. and quantum psychology. And quantum, every, it's, it's getting cheap to say those things. So if we want to do it correctly, we have to establish some very uh, deep connections if they exist, or else just stay at in our field and not, not try to borrow the language and so forth. But I think that there is a good chance that there are some deep connections. They haven't yet been fully explored. We're going to do a study here that's uh, a study on entanglement, which is uh, a deep physics uh, phenomenon. Uh, we're going to do a study investigating mental variables and if they affect entanglement in some ways or another. That's in the area of what we call micro psychokinesis. Wow. And we're doing this in collaboration with Noetics Institute in the United States. So there's, there's material there, but I would say for now we're still in the mm. let's wait and see, and, and we shouldn't go too fast saying everything is quantum and you know, dimensions and multiple dimensions. People get enthusiastic, but there needs to be a real uh, you know, expertise mm -hmm. behind that. After all these years, did you encounter yourself, a person, an individual, who has, who had, uh, very special qualities regarding all these phenomena? Yes, of course. Oh, you did? Yeah. One of, the, one of them that I really respect and appreciate is also one of the most well-known of our era, Joseph McMonagall. Who was the? Uh, he was the one of the star um, remote viewers uh, of the Stargate program, which was the program uh, of the CIA, and not not just the CIA, it was the DIA. The several intelligence agencies were financing this research, parapsychological research, for about 20 years, and they were financing basically psychic spying <laughs> with people in in Virginia or wherever, in the States, trying to see what's happening in Russia or elsewhere. And the Russians were doing the same thing, of course, on their side. And uh, one of the best, best viewers or subjects who, uh, who had the, the Medal of Honor received also by the United States for this was Joe McMonagall. And I know him and I've, we even did a little experiment together between France and the United States. So he's definitely somebody that I 
immediately say it's an exceptional subject. So with such a subject, then we are not only talking about weak signals. Yes. Like exactly. anybody, yeah, even yeah, me, exactly. not knowing everything about statistics exactly. or analysis, no, you wouldn't I could need say, statistics. okay, this guy is special. You wouldn't need statistics for just so much more. Ah, very interesting. You just have to study the case. You just have to study what he's done and, and then you would say... You and there are many others. There are others. Not, others. I don't know about many others. There are others. others. What is many? Is it thousands? No, I don't think there are thousands. But if a few, I think they're known, there are certainly a couple of dozen, a few. Uh, now, at his level, because that's a very high level of performance. Um, but then the question is, who do you want to investigate? Because either you go with the very special subjects, but then you have to basically dedicate your research to them. Mm -hmm. Or you go with the general population, let's say, and then you try to see what makes it a little bit better, a little bit worse. Mm -hmm. So there are two different approaches. One is called the elitist approach, and one is called the universalist approach. And we're interested in both right, here at the Institute of Institute. A more personal question. What makes you the most excited for the coming year or years about this field or about creativity? What Makes you like, oh, I can't wait. <laughs> well, what would make me excited about it? I can't wait. Well, I would like to have an out of the body experience <laughs> just to see what it's like. So, you never had one? Yes, I did actually. I did, but I'm not sure about it. I would like to have one wow. and I could be really absolutely sure about it. That's kind of fun. Last question. Uh, what would be your personal advice, either related to what you do on creativity or what you do here um, at the IMI on psychophysics? No, I'm not going to talk about parapsychology uh, anymore. Um, two or three advice on how we can be more future ready or future proof. Mm. Okay, oh, that's a big one. Uh, first advice read the literature. Don't form your opinion based on the, you know, the media, the general media. Don't form your opinion based on the official word. Uh, at any rate, we're in an era where there's more and more questioning of the official version of things. And in many areas, from politics to, you know, to war, uh, to fighting uh, medicine and fighting disease and so forth. There's a lot of questioning going on, which is, of course, helped by um, the Internet and so forth. But it's also polluted by the Internet because mm -hmm. there's so many different things being stated. So anyway, one thing would be to look at... Do your homework. In, inform yourself. <laughs> Do your homework. The second thing would be openness of mind, I think. And that's common to creativity and to this field of psychophysics is that we clearly see that an open mind, a curious mind, a person that's truly interested and not rigid about certain things, are both more intuitive, intuitive in our sense, in the sense of this field, and more creative also. So part of what I do when I'm in creativity context, as a consultant, as, as, a, as, a, um, as a trainer, is to emphasize mindset. The mindset, more than the tools, more than anything else, is the question of mindset. And a key aspect of mindset is openness. Hmm. So that would be a second thing. Um, and the third is personal exploration. Trying things out, and in particular, with altered states of consciousness. Uh, like altered states, is all states of consciousness that are you know, like dreaming, uh, hypnagogic state, when you're kind of floating in and out. Those are very interesting states. And I guess the most accessible of all is meditation, because that's, there are many, many ways to meditate, mm -hmm. and there are many people who know very well how to help others meditate, and it's not complicated. So if you want to go further at a personal level with all these issues, and, and I'm including creativity in this, 
meditation is really a royal path, I think. Wow, absolutely fascinating and very practical. Mm -hmm. Where do you want people to reach you or if they want to know more about your, what you do for creativity, for instance, any website, the, 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 how do you want them to reach you? Uh, well, through email. Okay. <laughs> and you have, you have a website? Yeah, I have a website. It's being redone. Okay, so I will put uh, whatever. Using, okay, I'll, I'll give you the website. Okay, website. excellent. And they can contact me through the institute. Okay, I will also put the link. And through my personal uh, email. Okay, yeah. excellent. Mm. Thank you so much, Mario. It's been absolutely uh, fascinating. Thank, Thank you. you.